Hello, I'm Kate Jabot. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. A new Defence Secretary has just taken charge at the Ministry of Defence. After four years led by former Guards Officer Ben Wallace, Grant Shapps, who has no defence experience on his CV, is in charge of the forces. But how much difference does or can that one individual make? We'll also dig into one of the pressing problems in Mr Shapps' entree, getting more people and skills into the forces. Is it time to rethink rules that bar many from service? Neurodiversity is essential, absolutely something we should seek rather than be frightened of. Age is not a really good criteria, I think. I can think of some quite senior whippets and some quite young people who are less fit. And could some of the most tightly controlled illegal drugs offer a cure for PTSD? We'll hear more about the growing research and hear one veteran's story. It's turned my life around. It really has. I'm not walking around angry with the world. Zidrev with Kate Chabot and Professor Michael Clark. So, Mike, uh, we talked about the runners and riders to replace Ben Wallace a few weeks ago. Grant Shapps, a bit of a surprise. Uh, yeah, it is in a way and not in others. I mean, it's it's a surprise because he has no defence background. I mean, and he's been, you know, he's minister for moving around. I mean, he he did six months in energy, where he's coming from now. He did three months as business secretary. He did six days as home secretary. Mm. Um, I mean, the longest job he had was transport, three years. And before that, longest job he had was in uh, chairman of the Conservative Party. No defence background whatsoever. So in that respect, it's a surprise. But it's not a surprise in another respect, because this is always going to be a caretaker job between now and the election for a year maybe 18 months at the very most. And what do they want in defence? They want somebody who will present the policy, not change it. So in that respect, it's not a surprise because they've got a, a, a man who does presentation. And, and let, in, in case nobody else says this, let me say this now, that Grant Shapps, without any political opportunism or any fanfare publicly, he and his family took in a Ukrainian family last year, didn't make yep. any fuss about it whatsoever. And I give him immense personal credit for doing that. He didn't try to manipulate it. We didn't know about it until afterwards, in effect. And I give mm. him great credit for that. Yes, yeah, an interesting thought. Um, let's bring in Forces News Westminster reporter, Sean Greszczek. Sean, hi. Um, I said at the start, Grant Shapps has no defence experience on his CV. And as Mike's been saying, he does have a lot of ministerial experience, though, doesn't he? Yes, absolutely. And that experience of moving from one department to another, he will need to bring those skills of being able to paddle fast and get across something quickly uh, right from the get go. And and he has been a senior minister on and off since 2010. He's been an MP since 2005. And what we will see, I think, is a lot of him now, especially, as Mike says, in the run up to the general election. And you can see why Rishi Sunak has decided to put a, a loyalist with him. You know, we know that it's probably unlikely that we'll hear about those big clashes behind the scenes that you know Ben Wallace was having with him over funding, that he might have an easier time putting someone like Grant Chaps uh, in his place. But he is going to have to paddle fast because, as we know, the defence and security brief is incredibly complex. Mm. Uh, Mike, um, you, you mentioned his experience. Um, and apart from like steering a, an even keel on the policy, do you think it tells us anything else about the prime minister and what he's looking for in the defence secretary? Yeah, he's looking for a defence secretary who will ease into an election. I mean, I can tell you now what the, what everyone's policy will be in an election. The government's policy on defence in the election will be that we are implementing this change programme, this transformation. We're doing our, our best in Ukraine. We're making a real difference. And the Labour Party's policy will be uh, we're having a review. That's what oppositions always say going into an election on defence because they don't want to commit themselves. So their policy is always that defence is such a mess, we'll have a review. And what what the Prime Minister wants is a Defence Secretary, in this case, who will smooth into an election campaign, sounding more convincing um, than some have sounded, and that's not a criticism of Ben Wallace, um, but, but sounding more convincing about the transformational aspirations that Defence has got. But we all know that Defence is marking time at the moment with the best will in the world. Certain things are happening, but there's no structural change to Defence. So we're marking time until a new government, whoever that is, uh, whether it's Conservative government or Coalition or a Labour government, until a new government decides to get hold of defence uh, and address our security environment, which is getting worse all the time. So, my um, service chiefs, will they be marking time as well in what they want from Grant Shapps, or will they be expecting something? 
Well, I don't think they'll be expecting too much from him any more than they would have from Ben Wallace if he'd stayed on till the election. But what the service chiefs are trying to do is all the right housekeeping in their own services. They've got plenty of issues on their plate, the army more than the Navy and Air Force in a more structural sense. And I think all three service chiefs are more than busy trying to map the course of the future and survive the present spending uh, tightening in order that their services then can move in the direction they really need them to move for the next uh, five or six years years after the election. Sean, let's just talk for a moment about Ben Wallace. It looks like he's been a Defence Secretary who did have an impact and did make a change. Absolutely. And I think that's down to the fact that he served as Defence Secretary under three Prime Ministers. He did the job for four years and you really need that time in order to be able to try and implement any kind of, of change. Throughout his tenure, he campaigned for higher defence spending amidst this continuing squeeze, which isn't going to go away. And he managed to secure a real terms increase of £24 billion over four years from 2020. He had an awful lot on his plate, didn't really stop, did it? Uh, the Afghanistan evacuation, the global pandemic, Ukraine, um, and within all of that, did manage to secure some money from the Treasury over that. And you could really tell, especially with him being a former soldier in moments like, for example, Operation Pitting, that moment where he was, you know, sort of teary eyed as he was talking about the fact that not everyone would would be able to come out. So, yeah, it would be interesting to see how history writes this up. And Mikey, he's going to, Grant Sharps is going to have to hit the ground running, isn't he? Because he's taking charge of Britain's support to Ukraine, an ongoing war. Uh, He knows a bit about it. He's had Ukrainians in his house, as you say. But I mean, it really is a steep learning curve. It is. And one of the things we've got to learn is, you know, what more can Britain do? We're doing all the right things in terms of the the political lead we're trying to offer, the support we're trying to offer in moral terms. But militarily, what more can we give Ukraine other than training that will make a difference? We've actually we've given them most of our stocks that will make some difference unless we then really bite the bullet and say, look, give them our own stocks, give them our Challenger 2s, even though we need them ourselves. But the fact is they're better off on the Ukrainian front than they are sitting in on Salisbury plane. You know, let's worry about our own restocking in two years time when the Ukrainians are in a better position. That would be a huge step to take. But this is a dilemma. What more can Britain do practically to really help Ukraine? We've done all the obvious things. We've now got to think about the less obvious things that would make a difference in Ukraine. And Sean, what else is Grant Sharps going to have to get to grips with quickly? Well, I think first, he's, he's really got to give the defence world and personnel confidence that he is going to be able to do a good job. Yes, he's moved from department to department, but the intricacies of understanding the differences and the nuances between the different services, I don't think we should underestimate you know, how quickly he has to get up to speed on that front and, and give everyone confidence. Uh, but mm-hmm. of course, that intray is bulging. It's huge. Um, the government has committed to increase defence spending to 2.5% of GDP when economic and fiscal conditions allow. There'll be pressure on that. He has to get across troop numbers as well, the threat from China. And then, of course, there'll be a a new head of the army coming in next year as well. So plenty in his intray to get through. Uh, Mike, as you said before, um, Ben Wallace will have the luxury of being able to be a bit more vocal on the backbenches. What do you think he might be speaking up about? I think he will talk about the structural change in our environment. And I think he will say, look, you know, defence is on is on the right path conceptually, intellectually, but it's not on the right path financially. And lots more needs to be done. It's not just a question of more money, but it's got to transform itself more fundamentally. And I just think he'll be free to say that. And I think he will get a sympathetic hearing. Most people really do respect Ben Wallace. And I think when, you know, an ex-defence secretary who's given four years to it and turned down the, the possibility of going for leadership or even prime minister. When he speaks about defence, I think a bit like George Robertson, he will be taken very seriously because he was is trusted as a man who cared, deeply cared about defence. Mike, stay with us. Sean Greszczyk, thank you so much for your time. Now, one of the tasks sitting in Grant Shapps' in-tray is to respond to the Haythornthwaite review of armed forces incentivisation. We talked through its wide-ranging list of recommendations to shake up forces' life and careers a few weeks ago. Well, since then, some of the most radical suggestions seem to have picked up some buzz. One is to ditch a centuries-old principle of British military service to help in the war for talent and skills. It's an almost universal rule that you can only join the forces at the bottom and work your way up. 
Instead, should we allow people to join a little older and with more experience and start higher up? The Defence People Minister has also spoken up about widening the recruitment net by allowing people to serve to an older age or with neurodiversity conditions such as ADHD or autism. Would this all help or hinder the forces? I've been talking to Lieutenant General James Swift, who retired last year after three years as Chief of Defence People. What we do know is that uh, our people and potential recruits are telling us that they don't want 30-year careers. Some will do, that's fine, but not sufficient to continue filling our current model. Uh, most people expect to have a variety of careers in their lifetime. And we, we need the, that talent, and therefore we've got to become a little bit more employee-centric and say, okay, if that's the talent that we want and that's the sort of careers they want, how can we change what we're offering in order to be attractive to those people? And as I say, it might be some people joining later, having accrued their skills elsewhere, or it might be the idea of people moving around within defence much more to have the variety that they seek without having to leave defence as an employer. And the armed forces have always recruited from the very bottom up, bringing young people in at the start of their adult life, training them up. Um, that idea to suggest that the forces could benefit from bringing in people a little older with skills and experience and bring them in a bit higher up, would that be heresy to suggest that? Um, it, it might appear to be for some people, but, but we already do it. And we've had some good examples recently as well. So, so for example, Padres join defence having already practised in their sending organisation. So they already naturally join at a later stage and that works really well for them. In COVID, the aeronautical sector, the aviation sector, took a um, downturn because we were obviously traveling less. So we were able to snap up both some aircraft engineers and also some aircrew who came and joined us, bringing with them all their relevant experience that they already had. And we didn't expect them all to stay forever, but uh, we hoped and, and it proved that we got value from them for a number of years and it worked for them too. So it's sort of win-win. In. The policy exists to do it. It's just that we need to be a little bit more open minded as to how we might find those opportunities that, that continue to meet the standards that we've got to achieve, of course, but uh, find our talent in different ways. Some of the conversations that have come from the Haythornthwaite Review have talked about the wider eligibility criteria, allowing people to serve to an older age. The Defence People Minister has talked about recruiting neurodiverse candidates with autism or ADHD. But of course, those criteria have been created for a reason. Yeah. And therefore, as your needs change, so the criteria should change. So, so they're not set in stone. And the fact that we are perhaps physically fitter for longer, live longer, it might mean that changing the age that we serve to could change. And of course, what we really need to do is move away from a sort of one size fits all and understand that there'll be some roles where age and experience are, are really positive criteria and, and other roles that are uh, really physically demanding, which might not suit everybody. But then I can think of some quite senior whippets and some quite young people who are less fit. So, so, so age is not a really good criteria, I think. It was necessary when you had a system that was sort of managed with a piece of paper and a pencil. But given the um, computing power that we've got now, I think we can be much more flexible than that. Um, and I think neurodiversity is essential uh, going forwards and absolutely something we should seek rather than be frightened of. I can think of a number of teams that I've been part of on operations as, as well as in sort of developing strategy where varied ways of thinking was perhaps sometimes difficult to manage but really key to success and, and if you've got a, an inclusive environment then having those different inputs is, it, well, it, just think of, I don't know, Math Matthew Side's book, Rebel Ideas, for example, evidence is why this can be um, really important. And, and I think it's something that we, we should strive to, to um, move towards. So to those people who might think that uh, this is a move to put diversity ahead of operational effectiveness, would you argue then that it actually increases operational effectiveness? Yeah, absolutely. It's not about diversity in terms of sort of um, hitting proxy targets. It's about having 
a team of teams. It's about having a broad range of inputs that we all take care to listen to in order to formulate plans, to avoid groupthink and to be uh, most successful at solving complex problems. I mean, when I was and so the job before Chief of Defence People, I was the General Officer Commanding of the 3rd United Kingdom Division. And in my planning group, so I was a Major General, but, but this guy was a Major. And he was absolutely critical to the formulating of our plans, regardless of his rank. He brought an expertise and a way of thinking that helped us to succeed. And embracing that sort of diversity is, is essential. I mean, these kind of changes, they're, they're radical, aren't they? they? They involve fundamental changes to some centuries-old principles of our armed forces. You know how the thinking and the services and the MOD works. Is anyone actually going to be bold enough to make that kind of change? Um, it is difficult. Uh, uh, and and it seems it, it, counterintuitively difficult because because on operations we're really good at the first principle of war, which is selection and maintenance of the aim, um, being really clear what the goal is we're trying to achieve, and then working as a team to achieve that, and understanding that each of us has a part to play in in the plan, and we find that really difficult in the people systems space. But I think it is necessary if we are going to succeed. Otherwise, we risk, uh, you know, if we just continue to do the same thing the same way, we risk getting the same result, uh, which is a badly paraphrased you know, version of Einstein's definition of insanity. Um, but we won't get the people with the skills we need if we're not prepared to conceive of these sorts of changes. That was Lieutenant General James Swift. Um, he has other big ideas for change, including making it much easier to switch your career between the three services. And you can hear the whole thing, including why shape-shifting buckets are a problem and Harry Potter staircases are helpful. Yes, I, I really did say that. It's in an extra edition of the SITREP podcast. It's online now. Um, Mike, if we go back to that rock-solid tradition of only working your way up through the British Armed Forces, no side entry, that used to be the model for every career but it's long since gone have other countries made that change to their militaries yet uh, well a bit more than um, we have I mean you see a bit more of it um, in the US uh, forces and in the Israeli forces for instance I mean I it may be happening in somewhere like China though we're not sure it certainly isn't happening in a country like Russia and then you can look at some other militaries you know say the you know Danish Swedish Netherlands military is a little bits of it there I think there have been bits of it as as James Swift was saying we've done it ourselves in the past and during the Second World War I mean quite a few people were given immediate rank because they were needed on the intelligence side or for some very specific specific role that they played. So it's not that we haven't done it before. The, the, what James is getting at is that we've got to do it in a more organised way and we've got to take in more than just the very necessary specialist skills in an emergency. And, you know, we talk about the, the problem of creating the soldier scholar. I mean, in the United States, they have lots of soldier scholars. David Petraeus is a very good example. Stan McChrystal, another one. These are people who were able to take a break from their career at a stage when it made a difference and really step out into a different world and then go go back into the structure without any bad effects on their career mm -hmm. progression. We find that difficult to do because we're such a small military. But in a way, we've got, we've got to create not just the soldier scholar now, but the soldier entrepreneur. We're looking for people who are not just, you know, go, go to do a PhD for three years and think about defence issues, but people who have that entrepreneurial spirit, the sort of major that mm -hmm. James Swift was talking about. We need those sorts of people. And we do have to think, I think, culturally differently about the, the, the way in which the armed forces construct themselves to absorb talent sideways as it were and we're still waiting for the government's official response to the Haythorn Thwaite review but the Whitehall mood music does seem very supportive of some fairly radical shifts the hard bit of course actually making it all happen yeah, and uh, I think, was it 67 recommendations from the Haythorn-Thwaite review? And the government mm -hmm. has said that they, you know, they intend to look very seriously at them. So the Haythorn-Thwaite review clearly is a holistic approach, not just a series of things that will tighten up the procedures at the edges. Um, will Whitehall take this on? Well, not this side of an election, but it might do an, the, the other side of the election. News, discussions and analysis. This 
is Zitrep. It's estimated that around one in 14 veterans of the UK's armed forces probably suffers PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Right now in the UK, the treatment options are much the same as for many other mental health conditions, talking therapies and antidepressant medications. But there is growing interest among some researchers about psychedelic drugs and whether they could not only help, but perhaps completely cure PTSD. Australia has just authorised psychiatrists to prescribe MDMA, a chemical used in the drug ecstasy, and psilocybin from magic mushrooms in certain cases. In the UK, these psychedelics remain among the most strictly controlled drugs, but some veterans are now going overseas in the hope that psychedelics could help them. Well, Forces News reporter Hannah King has been investigating. Hannah, hi. Uh, you've spoken to one veteran about his experience, haven't you? That's right, yes. Yeah. Spoke to a gentleman called Craig, who was in the Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineers. A lot of people will associate with his story. He was posted to Afghanistan and he saw some things which later resulted in severe PTSD. Like I say, lots of people will be familiar with what he went through. He, after two attempts to take his own life and trying literally every treatment in the book, he sort of, he was in the Last Chance Saloon and he found this organisation called Heroic Hearts that were trying to get veterans access to psychedelic drugs, which is very difficult because in this country, obviously, it's illegal. They try and fund taking veterans out to countries where it is legal to do these drugs. And when I say these drugs, I'm talking about, it's mainly uh, ayahuasca, which is an ancient plant remedy found in the Amazonian jungle. So Craig, like I say, last chance saloon, he was very skeptical about this, but thought, you know, when someone says, if you're going to take this drug, it's going to make you feel fantastic and probably sort your problems. Of course it is. I was, transported into space it was colors and bits flying past you and i can't put it into words and how it can make you feel afterwards is incredible i'm like it's turned my life around it really has i'm not walking around angry with the world and sleep sleep is such a such a massive thing when it comes to mental health if you're not sleeping you're I still don't understand it, but it works. <laughs> Hannah, a Craig's account sounds incredibly compelling, but we should just post a, a big reality check here. Don't try this at home. Yeah, oh no, absolutely. So this is delivered with a therapist and there's a lot to do with, you know, the environment that you take it in and the, they call it integration thing, the, you know, the sort of therapy that you go through afterwards. And it's, it's very much, um, it needs to be administered by um, a therapist and not just taken. Craig obviously was very, very skeptical about doing it. He, you know, he, he told me later, he's like, oh, they said, you know, we'll shake this rattle and it's just going to, it's going to, it's going to cure your PTSD and solve all your problems. And uh, for me, that's like the, the really interesting thing here, because, you know, I'm quite a, a skeptical scientific person mm -hmm. and I would have been exactly the same, but he is sort of evidence of what the potential that these drugs can do, I suppose. So the researchers who think there really is something in it, how do they think the psychedelics work to treat or even cure PTSD? The quick answer is they, they don't know exactly. But what they think is happening here is if you think of the brain having like a, a control center, um, a bit like having a conductor in an orchestra. And when they administer these psychedelic drugs, they're essentially taking away that conductor. They're sort of pausing that control center, which allows other parts of the brain to talk to each other so you can kind of form new pathways and the thing with PCSD is you sort of stuck in a stuck in a, a cycle of how you think about things how you think about that trauma and you can't get out of it and it just reoccurs and reoccurs by pausing that control center and allowing bits of the brain to talk to each other in these new neural pathways to form you can kind of approach or, or think about that trauma deal with that trauma in a totally different way and they think that it's a bit like pressing a reset button on the brain. They think that's what's happening here. So there has been a lot of, there were a lot of really impressive um, studies coming out, uh, have been coming out over recent years. Um, and just sort of to name one, they did a study in the US which took 100 uh, people, most of them were veterans, 100 people with severe PTSD, and they gave them MDMA alongside psychotherapy. And the results were incredible. And you're going to hear now from Professor Joe Neal, who is a professor of psychopharmacology at the University of Manchester. 
67% of those people in that, those 95 people in that trial, no longer met the, met the criteria for having PTSD. This is an extraordinarily powerful and um, positive result that we have not seen before. What is so unique about psychedelics is that they heal people. In psychiatry, we don't talk about healing people. Professor Joe Neal is obviously a complete advocate for this treatment. And it's, it's, as with anything, there's two sides here. It's important to say there are other experts who emphasize the need for caution here. At the moment, all psychedelic drugs are in are, are class A drugs. And this is something which very much frustrates uh, Professor Joe Neal. Um, but like I say, there are other experts who emphasize the need for caution. And we'll hear now from uh, Professor Neil Greenberg, who is an expert in military mental health and specifically PTSD. It's quite intensive. It takes a couple of therapists. It takes you know, carefully orchestrated uh, administration of a, of a drug which has potential to do harm. It's given over many sessions. That's great, it will help people, but actually if you can't get bulk standard trauma-focused CBT over eight sessions on the NHS at the moment, how are we going to make this more complicated uh, intervention freely available? We should be using the, the simplest intervention that will get someone well uh, to start off with and not jumping into things that might seem shiny and glossy. Uh, and Hannah, it sounds like we're a long way off from a scientific consensus on all of this. We are, and scientists like Professor Jo Neal are frustrated that things aren't moving forward as quickly as she would like, and research is restricted because it's a class A drug, and she's campaigning for them to to uh, reschedule it so it's easier to research with. The other thing here is the organisation that I mentioned that helped Cray get out to Peru and take ayahuasca. They exist to try and get veterans access to psychedelic drugs, but they, they at the moment they they can't get charity status. Or well, they're, they're 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 applying to get charity status. It's very complicated for obvious reasons. So we've got a long way to go, both with research and with sort of getting realistic pathways to this. Uh, as if if we're to think of it as a therapy for PTSD, but you know it, it's promising. Hannah, good to hear from you. Thank you so much for that. Um, and you can watch Hannah's film, Psychedelics Cured My PTSD, on the Forces News YouTube channel. Uh, Mike, uh, you could understand some people thinking it's a bad idea to use illegal mind-altering drugs to alleviate PTSD, but, but our understanding of the condition has already been on a transformative journey, hasn't it? Yes, it has. And I think we, we all understand that PTSD, for, you know, first of all, it's got to be dealt with with human interaction. I mean, I, I'm involved with a, an organization called Waterloo Uncovered, which is about helping veterans with some PTSD symptoms by involving them in groups, in this case, at the Waterloo battle site itself. But, you know, years ago, I remember I had a long conversation with a young officer who'd had PTSD from Iraq in 2003. And he said the low point, the worst point, was when he had a massive row with his wife because mm. the green beans were cold when they put their meal down. And she said, what was happening? And Hannah was talking about this, neural pathways. PTSD, apparently, has the effect of collapsing neural pathways in the brain, which is why you need drugs to actually heal those neural pathways and the way they work. Because he said the logic is the beans were cold because, you know, you, you you weren't keeping your eye on them in the cooking process because you don't care mm. about it very much. You don't care about them because you don't care about me. And you don't Got care it. about me because nobody cares about me. And nobody cares about me because I was in Iraq and nobody cared about Iraq. And I saw men um, being killed. I saw terrible things in Iraq and nobody cared about it. And that's how this logic process suddenly come, becomes telescoped in the way the neural pathways work. And he said to me, he said, you know, he needed a lot of support. He came through it very well in the end, both he and his wife did. He said, but we need a lot of support. But he said, you needed some drugs to, to, to heal what was happening in your brain. So there's clearly a role for it, but obviously it's got to be under very strict control. And the most important thing in PTSD, Simon Wesley, you know, in the King's Center for mm -hmm. Military Health has proved this over and over again. The most important thing for PTSD is the group. It's the, it's the people, your mates, your, your unit, the people around you who understand and can just be with you. You know, human interaction is the most important thing, but drugs are certainly a part of it.
That's such a fascinating insight. Thanks for that, Mike. And my thanks to all of our guests this time. Don't forget, there's much more from Lieutenant General James Swift and his thoughts on radically rethinking forces careers in an extra edition of the SITREP podcast online now. Mike and I will be back with another SITREP next Thursday. Until then, from me, Kate Chabot, thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.